Um, first of all, thank you for, uh, to Nick for inviting me to, to talk today, um, and I'll then reiterate the thanks to you for making a contribution to the work that we're involved in at the moment with a new National Centre for Wellbeing. It's called What Works Wellbeing. Um, there's a number of What Works centres around the country, and they're evidence centres, and this is a newly forming one. I'm not going to say formed because it's only really forming and has been going for, um, uh, through the process of developing in the past six months. Um, we're a collaborative team from a number of institutions. I'm at Brunel University, um, but we've got um, partners <coughs> from the London School of Economics, also from Brighton University and from Winchester. And that collaboration mixes people who have experience and expertise in the sports sector, in the cultural sector, um, and in the kind of well-being measurement and definition sector. I guess that's, that's what you call it. Um, we're actually leading one particular theme in the centre, and it is around culture and sport. Um, it's quite interesting to be here today. Um, my, I largely work in the sports sector and in community sport and um, I'm involved in a lot of kind of partnership work and it's really fascinating to hear people talk about co-production and partnership because although we might at first think that culture and sport don't have an obvious link, when I'm listening to people who do work in the culture and arts sector, those links have become, become quite, um, be quite, quite clear to me. So it's really um, great to be here. The focus of what we're doing in the culture and sport project is on trying to explore through evidence reviews, and we'll start that work after, the, after um, this first six months, trying to look at well-being inequalities in the sector um, and looking at interventions, particular population groups, target groups, whatever you want to call them, um, where we can see well-being inequalities and or where we can look at evidence for how culture and sport can um, do something about those well-being inequalities. So um, I said I wasn't going to talk for very long, and I'm not, because what I want to try and do is to um, get some conversations with you about how best to do our work. I'll give you a little bit of an insight as to where we're at and what we've been doing, um, and then I'm going to identify some questions that we really would um, value your input on, and then spend about 10 minutes with you discussing those, and then um, the rest of the time feeding back to us. So let, you, let me just tell you where we're at at the moment. We started this work in June. We're in something called a collaborative development phase, um, which is about co-production. And I'm going to apologize for these very sanitized, unartistic, uncreative slides. Um, but I quickly wanted to tell you, you know, they kind of don't speak to the, um, I guess, the depth and the complexity of the work we've been doing in trying to bring together a range of stakeholder voices about well-being in the culture and sports sectors. We're in this phase one. It's called the collaborative development phase. We've been working with policymakers, commissioners and managers, academics and scholars, service delivery people, public and citizen groups um, who have been working with us to try and think about how we're conceptualizing defining well-being and what counts as evidence that thorny question I think everybody seems to be uh, seems to be working with at the moment the purpose of this is get to, to get to a point at the end of this six months where we suggest an evidence review program it will by definition have to be selective but we want to focus on the most important questions around social diversity, context, culture, and sport at this moment that we can start looking for the evidence around those particular topics. Um, we'll then move, and, and these are overlapping phases. These phases are never kind of distinct and finished and um, separate from each other. We, as part of that work, are really focused on mobilizing, translating that evidence. We know very well that a lot of the evidence is either in high-level academic journals or very, very long policy documents that nobody ever reads. Um, and so we want to work really closely with people who know how to um, ensure that the evidence is in a usable form for the people who need to use it. And I think that goes back to our evidence review questions. The questions we want to ask also need to be those that, that the stakeholder groups need answering. And of course, with that range of stakeholder groups, from policy to participants, you can see the challenges we're having, which is why we need some input from as many people as we possibly can. And the f part of that work will also be over the next two and a half years um, trying to think about ways of disseminating information through public exhibitions, not just in academic spheres, but in places like this, um, in places that are where people are. And so ideas for that kind of thing are certainly ones we would uh, be interested in. These are the kind of groups, and this is not an exhaustive list. We started out with around 55 partners. That's growing all the time as we get to know different people in the culture and sports sectors. Again, I don't think there's a cutoff point for this as we go through the project. I think that we can take advice, we can take information, we can talk to people throughout the 
the, the rest of the project over the next three years. Um, but they're the kind of groups that we started out with um, in terms of the work that we're doing. Um, and you can see that kind of rage. And we have to report on this on the 16th of November, so we don't have much time left. But throughout this project, we've been going, trying to go out to public groups around the culture and sports sector um, to see what people are doing. I'm a qualitative re uh, researcher. All of my work is about participation and participatory approaches. Um, and over the next two weeks, I'll mostly be doing mosaics, knitting, um, some yoga and some dance, um, really to, to look at the experiences that people have in those uh, particular activities um, and, and try to explore with them the ideas about well-being that they have through those um, activities. So these are the kind of methods we've been using, very mixed methods, um, very uh, particularly qualitative at the moment in the collaborative development phase. We ran some workshops and some overlapping interviews with key people to ask them about what well-being meant in their work, what well-being does mean to them. It's not easy. Um, we were looking at the types of interventions or programs or activities, whatever you want to call them, and talking to people about evidence. We have engaged a Delphi-type questionnaire because, you know, I said at the beginning, we're going to have to be selective about these evidence reviews. We just simply won't be able to do everything, but we need a starting point. We need a set of topics, questions, particular groups that we think, and interventions that we think are really important to explore. Um, and in red there, where it says section two, on the first Delphi questionnaire. That's the kind of focus of the discussions that would be really useful for us today. Um, you know, what population settings, activities, do you think are the most important to try and explore in terms of evidence as we start this process? And crucially, what are the processes by which those things happen to enhance well-being, um, and, and what are the well-being outcomes, and the outcomes sort of linked to the definitions and determinants of well-being, but crucially we want to know about the processes. Um, and actually we will, irrespective of the rest of the evidence reviews, we will do an evidence review on co-production. It's central to the work we're doing in sport, it's central to the work that people in the culture sector that are on our team are doing, and it seems to be quite an important arena or area and focus point for what I've heard today. So, um, and we're also doing this observation work and follow-up interviews at the moment with participants. So, I want to just try and get into a discussion with people, if I may. These four end are the kind of four last questions that we ask people on our Delphi survey. We ask them, what are the key dimensions of well-being? the ones that are most important. In, we ask them about culture and sport, but I think when you're thinking about them now, think about them in the context of the work that you do. And those might be about what, what you might call personal well-being, might be specific to culture and sport, they might be social dimensions. I'm not going to define them for you. You can, you can speak to them um, uh, as, you, as you wish. We will, because this is the nature of evidence refuse, have to think about the particular populations um, that we are looking for evidence for. I mean, evidence reviews are not a precise science, um, and equally, in order to do them effectively, you have to, be, you have to target the questions in a particular way. Um, and, and we would like to know from you what populations you think are the most important, important ones for us. I mean, it might be you say, well, it's general population, um, and, and that's where we go with it. But for some people, it might be specific, targeted populations that you think are more important at this stage. Um, then the, the ninth question in this, uh, in this survey was, in your experience, what settings are most likely to be delivering effective well-being um, interventions? And I know the language of interventions is, um, is difficult as well. If you want to use the word activities or programs or practices, that's, that's absolutely fine. And then what do you think are most likely to have the strongest impact on well-being? So what I'd just like to do is invite you to either think about those on your own or with someone next to you or just in small groups for around, I guess we've got seven or eight minutes to do this. And yeah, five minutes, we've got five minutes, sorry, to do this. Um, I'll give you my email address at the end because like I said, this is ongoing knowledge exchange. We'll take information as we go through the project. So if you could pick one of those um, or maybe two, if you think two are really important, think about it and talk about it a bit with someone or in a small group for five minutes and then we shall bring the... Um, bring what you've said back to, to, um, to the audience and I will be frantically writing down um, what you say. Hello, uh, I'm Richard Beals. I work for Artswork, a national youth arts development agency uh, and one of the uh, Arts Council England Bridge organisations. Um, we just had a very uh, brief uh, conversation. I think one of the 
key constituents, uh, you won't be surprised to hear me say, uh, but that uh, should be part of this conversation uh, more centrally uh, than they otherwise appear are children and young people themselves. Um, a report came out only today, I believe, uh, by the Equalities and Human Rights Commission, uh, Is Britain Fairer? Uh, since 2010, if you're under 35, uh, you can legitimately answer no uh, to that question. Uh, young people, uh, there, there is no policy. Uh, it's almost natural selection. It's you're young, you'll thrive, you'll, you'll see this through. Um, and actually, that's not the case. They're being locked out of many of the narratives of our lives uh, and what we've uh, been discussing today. So I think the relationship between health, well-being, and young people, children, uh, because it has a, a knock-on effect in terms of their learning and education is absolutely uh, paramount. Thank you. Um, one of the um, population groups that we will focus on, we're not entirely sure um, uh, whether it'll be around sport, culture, or both, um, whether we need to think about children and young people in disadvantaged communities over and above any, any other communities, but young people will be the focus point for, for at least one of our reviews. So, yeah, thank you. Really important. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think, I, I think you're right. I think there, there are specific overlaps. I think what we also have to be mindful of is that there are other evidence organizations who are doing work around some of the things we would want to look at and we need not to duplicate. So we're in conversation with the Early Intervention Foundation, for example, and NICE um, um, and the Center for Better Aging to ensure that what we do doesn't duplicate what's already out there, but that actually adds value. Um, and, and I think in some of the reviews, we can quite well, and for good reason, look at sport and culture. In some other ones, we may need to look at particular cultural interventions and particular sporting interventions, but I take your point, and I think it's really important. Thanks. Others? There's two at the back, and then we'll come down the front. Um, uh, this is kind of a statement more than a... That's a question, really. It's fine. Um, my name's Charlotte Moore, and I'm the mother of two of the makers in um, the Project Artworks exhibition, uh, George and Sam Smith. Um, and this, what I'm going to say relates to both this and to what Rebecca said, really. Uh, and I'm going to concentrate on Sam, my second son. Um, just uh, four years ago, which was when Sam started going to Project Artworks, which he goes to once a week... Um, throughout the year. Uh, four years ago, when Sam started, he was um, violent, both to himself and to other people. Um, he was biting, kicking, hitting. Uh, he was destructive. He was, he was breaking china and glass constantly. He was arguably, uh, you know, borderline unmanageable. He was throwing things out of the window. <laughs> he was throwing things down the loo. He was flushing stuff down the loo all the time. Um, he was tearing stuff up. It, you know, the, the list goes on and on. So Sam's, Sam's behavior then was making it difficult for him to continue to live in a normal home environment and very difficult for him to access anything in the community. Now, four years on, nearly all of those behaviours have disappeared. And Sam is living at home, as he always has been, uh, but he's living at home now easily, happily and naturally in a family of five. Uh, the, the violence, the destructiveness, the aggression has almost vanished. Now, I'm not saying that his engagement with Project Artworks is the only factor. There are many factors. Mm. But I, I believe that it is an immensely large factor in this incredible improvement in his well-being and in the res in the result as a result in the well-being of the whole family um, and I'd love to just leave it at that I'd love to just leave you with the fact that not only does Sam create lovely big colorful paintings but he also thoroughly enjoys life and we are much more able to enjoy living with him 
But because we live in the society we live in, I'm not quite going to live in, leave it at that. I'm also going to say it's financially a good thing as well. Because Sam was borderline unmanageable. I was thinking about trying to get him uh, to live in an institution where he would have cost the taxpayer a great deal of money. That's not because I wanted that, but that's, I felt that that might be what I had to do. And something like Project Artworks, it actually you know, represents a saving, yeah. <laughs> um, because Sam now lives at home very much more cheaply uh, than if he'd had to go to an institution, which is what nobody wanted anyway. So anyway, that's a rather long ramble, but it's just... Um, you know, that's just one example of a really strong link between artistic involvement and physical and mental well-being. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> this lady in front, and then we'll come down to the front. Hello, Lucy, again. Um, through my experience, um, randomised control trials are needed to have the robust evidence research. So we're talking five years plus. Um, the example given by, um, about the um, Nordic, you know, in Sweden. Um, I also think that not, not one shoe fits all. Um, you know, we have to tailor, make, um, the cultural and sport interventions that meet minority groups. And as a community dance practitioner that's been working in Kent and Medway for over 15 years, uh, community settings, public spaces um, need to be used, they're cost effective, and they reach the people that need to be reached. Thank you. Can I just make a tiny People hear me. They were the randomized controlled trials um, suggest that you make an intervention, this kind of um, word that's a little bit mm. um, suspect uh, on people's lives, uh, whether they know it or not, and you see what the effects of that intervention are. Um, these were just, they, these were population studies that had been carried out for many, many years, uh, and they documented whether people went to galleries, whether they went to cinemas, whether they went to concerts. Um, so it wasn't anything out of the ordinary, and it wasn't a trial. They weren't being experimented on. It was just it was something that was trying to understand people's lifestyles. So that was just a tiny point of clarification. I, I'm not sure that we didn't necessarily need to perform trials. We just need to use the data that we have in another way. Uh, if I've got time, I'll talk very briefly about how we're going to approach evidence. But there's a, a lady here and, and, one at the, and two at the back. If, and then that's probably it, is it, Nick? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Hi there, my name is Amy. I'm representing Tanner Art Gallery today, um, but I'm kind of taking my hat off because I'm also involved with um, Black History Month in Brighton. Um, and one of the kind of observations, kind of working with diverse communities kind of all year round um, on a voluntary basis, um, it's very much about, I think, kind of large organizations and venues supporting their local communities. Um, we've been working with Brighton Dome and Brighton Museum for a number of years um, and they really kind of offer us, offer us the space and support to do our own community events and so for instance I was sharing with uh, an artist colleague here that we can have in one kind of community event um, African fashion and then also a football demonstration and dance and film and you know lots of kind of multi art form activity that's free for the community and it really brings people together. So I think in terms of interventions, um, it's about kind of having experiences that are facilitated through the communities themselves yeah. and just really offering that support and dialogue. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, we are running out of time. I think we've got one minute and there's two people at the back. If you could just make a brief comment and then I can pick this up at, at the end of the day. I'll be here for the, for the rest of the day. So. Yeah, Rona Topaz, freelance uh, facilitator. Um, just want to comment on question eight, um, sorry, question nine. Uh, in my experience, the settings that are most effective in, um, in delivering wellbeing interventions are settings that are more conducive, both in terms of the staff and in terms of the uh, actual physical environment. Uh, I work in nursing homes and the staff are not conducive to wellbeing. They are conducive to maintenance 
and in some cases uh, even worse than that. Um, I work in uh, sheltered housing units and day centers. The staff are conducive to empowerment of the service users and the interventions are far more uh, effective in that respect. Thank you. And the last comment from the lady here. Thank you. Hi, I'm from two local NHS commissioning organisations and we've been doing some work on health inequality locally. Um, and we've been, kind of from the evidence we have around differences in life expectancy, we tend to target the work we're doing towards those people who tend to experience lower life expectancy. And as, as I'm sure you know, you can kind of gather that evidence at ward level from joint strategic needs assessment and data that public health hold. So that might be a useful target to look yeah. at. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Like I said, I can pick this up at the end of the day. Yeah, and yes, yes, I will. So um, I'm going to leave it at that. It just briefly, these are the kind of priority areas. These are the things I'm sure you've been talking about. These are the things that are coming out from our other stakeholder work, you know, common definitions, uh, looking at what works and what doesn't. And just finally on this uh, point about evidence, uh, randomized control trials and all of that kind of thing, we will take a best evidence approach. The randomized control trial is not necessarily, and probably not, not always, it's not necessarily the best type of study to use. Um, and we know that in culture and sport, many other studies types are used. Um, and the, uh, the inclusion of qualitative um, data is going to be really important to our project. Um, I said I'd give you some information at the end there. Um, and my email's there. I've got a Twitter account. I'm really excited about that. I haven't got many followers, so follow me. Um, and if you want to, if you, if you want to uh, communicate with me that way, I'm happy to do that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.